And whether we like it or not, that insurance is sold, not bought, is, is a fact today. Whether it is a satisfactory one, clearly not. The question is how do we make it a product that is appealing? And then the question is, after we've had that disruption going on and for a while, creates a bit of vertical questioning of the value chain, which, which we are going through. I think we're going to go through that for some time still, and AI will bring some opportunities. I think it's going to bring the question of how to integrate insurance products among a broader proposition that is bought, not sold. And that's perhaps where the, the lovers of insurance are going to realize that actually insurance value is better when it's packaged into something else that is not insurance, into service, for example. And, and that, for me, is a key trend of our business is, is over time, it's going to be a long time, is, is insurance could disappear as such into something that is either very simple or even not even visible to the customer, and, but they buy a service, they don't buy a product. We felt it would give us the best access to the strongest possible group of senior insurance decision makers. InsureTech Insights is a must-do conference, I think, for the network that is built here. Good morning and welcome to AI and dynamic pricing and the future of underwriting. Um, you've been hearing a lot about AI the last uh, day and, and will do today and generally it's, an, it's a topic that is getting a lot of coverage in the industry. So our, uh, our challenge for you today is to make sure this is interesting for you and you have something to take away from the end of it. And uh, I think with a, with a panel that is made up of three people from large uh, insurance and reinsurance organizations and two people from, uh, I'm not going to call them startups anymore, I think scale up is, is the word today. Uh, if we don't have a little bit of uh, back and forth, shall we say, then I think we'll all be disappointed. So hoping to make it interesting and for you to take something away from this. Um, I think, I believe there are questions coming on from Slido. Uh, I, we've got about three hours worth of discussions here, so I, I think I have to, if I'm going to have to pose questions, and I might have to use Slido myself. Um, but please do free put, put your questions up on stage and we'll um, endeavour to add those into the discussion. So anyway, I'm going to kick off, ask each of the panellists to give a brief introduction and then we'll start digging into the, uh, the topic. So Richard, perhaps you could go first. Thanks. I, I'm Richard. I'm the CEO of Sotora. Uh, we help the commercial insurance industry target, select and price risk using um, billions of external data points and artificial intelligence. At the core of why our, our partners work with us is to transform their underwriting processes both in, in kind of small SME lines, but also large commercial through to reinsurance. So I'll talk a bit about how AI is impacting that and, and where our deployments are, what's working, what's more challenging. All right. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Marcus Winter. Um, my job is to find the next profit pools for the reinsurance group, and we agree for the three to five to seven years horizon. So we combine strategy, innovation management, data analytics, and a few targeted business development areas, and AI is one of the core components for us going forward. Hi, I'm Laurent Rousseau. I'm the deputy CEO of Scoville PNC, and I run a team of underwriters underwriting single risk or portfolio MGAs, um, either in very specialty niche risks or in very heavy, smelly, dirty uh, risks like construction, infrastructure, energy, and so on. Good morning, I'm Michael. I lead on all things machine learning and AI for Prudential. Good morning, my name is Ryan Cottonsetti. I'm CEO of Cape Analytics. We leverage computer vision and AI to extract proprietary data from imagery and other data sources, uh, which we then provide to insurance underwriters and reinsurers to help them better understand the risk that they're writing. And Fantastic. So, Laurent, uh, we hear a lot about AI across different industries. Insurance uh, occasionally gets a bad rap for uh, being slow in innovation. You, you were in the banking world for a while came into insurance, what sort of brought you into banking, or brought you from banking into insurance, um, and particularly with the kind of opportunities coming out from AI? So I started my career post-internet bubble, early 2000, on, on a trading desk, essentially. Um, why that? I like, I guess, macroeconomy, I like finance, and the intellectual challenge of actually what ended up happening, which is a total reshuffling of the, of the value chain. And if you look today, how trading is structured, intermediation has shrunk to uh, you know, a small portion of what it was. And what you would call underwriting in insurance, so actually the trading, the, the risk taking, has remained very strategic. And I think this is maybe one point we can uh, come back on later on when you talk about AI. And the disruption of value chain is, is where do you start? Is it intermediation? Is it risk taking and underwriting? 
Um, the second point I would make is um, the part of finance. So I turned to insurance 10 years ago, joining school, um, and then went into very traditional underwriting roles, reinsurance and insurance. And a major limitation in comparing finance to insurance is in the standardization of data. The raw material is very structured in finance. On a trading desk, information flow on screen real time. Um, whereas in insurance, I guess, I would, I would oppose real time to real life. And, and real life is, is a little more complex and hairy than, than real time. And the third point um, is the advantage, I think, of having moved to insurance with some outside benchmark is actually quite an advantage. I think it's, you can only really appreciate inflection points in an in, in industry if, you, if you've seen others. And it's, I think it's a very simplistic rule, but insurance lag finance by five to 10 years. And I think that helps managing time. And I think when we're gonna talk about AI now, it's imagination, if not fantasy, can go very fast. The question is how do you balance this with with a day-to-day -day business, uh, commercial circumstances, uh, a market that you need to manage, not over 10 years, but in, you know, year by year. And that to me, this balance of how do you have a long-term vision and how do you manage it with quarterly earnings is, is when you run a team and a business and you're accountable to shareholders uh, as a listed company is, is a fine balancing act. Good, well, I want to come back on that disruption point and particularly given that you are managing underwriters and, and just sort of talk a little bit about what is the impact on the underwriter with, with AI? But be before I do that, Michael, you, you joined the industry very recently. You run, or you run a very large team of data scientists. Uh, interested just what brought you into, what brought you into the in insurance industry uh, and a bit about you know, where you're seeing some of the specific opportunities of potential that you're actually, you believe you can make a difference with your team. So I, I joined uh, not 10 years ago, or whatever Laura has uh, on his books now. I joined 132 weeks, two days, and two hours ago. Um, I have is that, sorry, is that, is that because it's painful or because you're celebrating? I'm, I'm sure it's exceedingly painful. Um, <laughs> so um, um, I, I'm not particularly interested in, in finance and insurance, um, but um, what I do like is um, having the ability to look after our customers. And uh, I think insurance, at its heart, has always tried to do that. And I think AI gives us a completely different way to do that and be much more holistic. And by looking after our customers, therefore also looking after ourselves and after our shareholders. And I think that, that's something that, uh, and it sounds really trivial, but I think it's absolutely revolutionary in what AI can bring to to us and how we interact with our customers, be them consumers in, in, in the prudential world or whatever it is, ships or what, what do you say the dirty stuff was? Smelly, dirty, Smelly, heavy. dirty stuff. Yes, you look after the smelly, dirty stuff in a different way as well. Right, and you're mostly a personal lines underwriter, so that's probably a little bit um, <laughs> interesting way of describing your clients to put the dirty stuff, or is, is that just a more <laughs> generic, generic term? <laughs> Uh, you use these words, I don't understand them. Like, no, right. <laughs> <laughs> what is this stuff? So you must, oh, you're, you're learning insurance language fast. Um, <laughs> so you, you were we talking earlier, you mentioned the dynamic, and you had, I think you had, what was me as a sort of a slightly different, but I, I think a very uh, sort of positive view on what dynamic underwriting means in terms of your clients. Can you just talk a little bit about how you, how you think about dynamic underwriting when you engage with your clients? So I, the, the, the kind of underwriting that I like is when we don't do underwriting. Um, and what I mean by that is um, all this data stuff that, uh, that everybody's talking about is uh, what it gives us is an ability to understand what's coming our way before it's actually coming to us. So at the moment, we have people come to us, and we try and attract everybody, and then we have to say, no, not you, no, actually not me, because I'm much less healthy BMI than all. Um, so, um, um, and we, that's kind of tedious uh, for us as, as well as for our customers. So what we should actually do is understand the customers before they come to us um, in as detailed way as possible. And I always tell my colleagues to look after the 3.5 billion people in Asia. We need 3.5 billion models. But more 
what that enables us is not just to have an understanding and then somebody knocks on our door, and obviously nobody ever knocks and knocks on our door, because why would they? But to actually proactively select the right customers. And that, that is a type of underwriting that I like. Uh, the kind of underwriting we are forced to do at the moment is um, uh, tedious, pointless, um, not actually tethered to reality. So for instance, uh, one of the examples I always give, 92% of our customers in, in the Philippines don't smoke. And if you've ever been to the Philippines, you know it's the general population is kind of the other way around. Um, so either my colleagues have been extremely careful in selecting the right risks, or something else is going on. Uh, so uh, and I think those are kind of things, so uh, you have to stop me, otherwise I can't talk it. <laughs> so, um, so, so one of the things that we've built recently um, for a, um, a pilot in Thailand um, is um, where we do underwriting and obviously, I don't want to do underwriting in the first place, but unfortunately, my colleagues insist on this stuff, so we are trying to make it easier. Um, so uh, we've done underwriting on from, a, from a selfie. So we get age, gender, BMI, location, which is important in Thailand, and smoking status just from a selfie. And quite frankly, as our colleagues from Munich Re will probably attest from a life point of view, that's pretty much 98% of your risk parameters covered. Mm. So good. Um, good. Okay, well, that's, that's that's really helpful, and I think that whole Asian side is given you the signs that you are out there and the opportunity that market mm. we should come back to. Um, but uh, Mark, I think just to turn to you for a minute, you, you've mentioned in the introduction there that that AI is one of the uh, strategic choices that, that Munich Re have made. Um, I, to, to two questions in here. So one is. As a reinsurer, people tend to think of AI being more, rather like Michael describes it, around personal lines. Um, you, as a reinsurer, you tend to be one step removed from the client. So I'm interested in, you know, one, what is driving that, that strategic decision around AI, but also at a board level, um, to what extent do you believe your board have really embraced that, or do they see AI as one of many things they should understand, it's, it's out there, but it, is it, do they really feel that is actually fundamental to changing the way the industry writes? So is that fundamental change to the board? And, and then you know, from a reinsurance point of view, how, how really relevant is that? Um, it is absolutely core for the strategy. Um, we have um, started maybe three, four years ago to really um, um, put up and, and build out our data science uh, capabilities, including the AI component, not just limited to that. As a reinsurer, uh, the percentage of our colleagues that have um, um, some level of numeracy and, and, and some mathematical degrees and, and um, underwriting tends to be these days a more an actuarial and mathematical science than maybe 15 years ago. Um, I was the first person on the, that has a mathematical training on the business side for, for, for the Eastern Hemisphere when I joined. And uh, that has completely changed. But so, so now we have a lot of activities, a lot of mathematically trained people. And we put the um, artificial intelligence and the wider data analytics skills on top of that. So we build out regional analytics centers so that we can, in a regional setup um, in major hubs, work with our centrally developed frameworks and models, um, work with the data of our clients and with the external data. So for us, that is a huge, a huge priority. We have, um, we, we have a, a much smaller number of people within a reinsurer as compared to some of the primary insurers. Um, but we have r r roughly 200 data specialists um, around the globe, which for us is a significant share of our total number of employees. And, and when you say work with your clients, is that, is that so as you underwrite your clients, you want to get better access to, to your data, or are you going a little bit beyond just this is the one-way view of that, of that risk? Uh, for us, it's all about around um, risk insights. So we, we're not in the... Um, Robot, robots and chatbots and, and all of the process related topics for us is all about risk insight. So what you described, how can you identify out of um, the existing data sets, internal and external data sets, how can, can you identify for your clients um, parameters that have a, a higher likelihood that the, the, the clients do smoke or not, that has a, a lot of impact on the, on the life side, on, on the health side as well. Um, on the, um, on the non-life side, um, cyber topics, building related topics, um, commercial, industry related um, questions, um, upstream data for um, oil pipelines, all of those types of data 
Um, that, that is very important for us. And then once you have the data, you want to have tools to make sense out of the data. Um, and that's where we, where we use the um, kind of, uh, we have a team that goes for external data. So we have a team that actually actively uh, acquires external data. And we then combine it with the internal ideation processes to come up with insights using um, AI and other tools. Right. So, so Richard, so we've got three large uh, organizations here. You're, you've built a company running for four or five years providing AI into insurance. Presumably your life's just easy. You just turn up and uh, you show them what you're doing and you're signing up clients. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, it, it can be easy. Um, I think, I think, kind of more generally, it's, it's it's nuanced in a sense. I think you have very forward forward thinking people who are, you know, thinking, how do we transform ourselves in the next five years? Um, and, and they kind of think existentially sometimes, such as given the consolidation and given the, the shuffling of, of where value is created and um, kind of almost like the liberation between capital and risk, which is happening at the moment. We have to we have to change what we're doing to survive and, and continue to kind of hold on to our market share. You also get um, you know individuals and, and companies that have a very overdetermined sense of identity, so they kind of think I'm an actuary. This is what I've done all my life, and I, I will continue to do that. Um, some companies definitely lack a beginner's mindset to AI, where they're not so much thinking about the problem they're trying to solve, but they're thinking more about the tools in which they've always used. Um, so we've encountered both. I think I think it's different at the individual level. It's also different at the company level. I think. The board and, and, and the C-suite generally set the, the culture of the extent to which you're, you're short-term locally optimizing or long-term globally optimizing your, your business and, and the balance between the two. Definitely, I think, on, on, on the point I think you made around, um, I think there is consensus increasingly that per-risk underwriting doesn't make sense economically given the frictional cost of, of underwriting. And moving AI can, can drive a big shift towards um, almost like pre-underwriting, where you've underwritten every single risk that you will see in, 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 in a year. So you've got a view of the, the insurable population. Um, and, and that's kind of, I guess, yeah, reversing a bit of this information asymmetry that's always existed, where the insured has more data than the broker, the broker has more data than the primary layer, the primary layer has more data than the, the reinsurance layer. AI is meaning that's been reversed, it's been flipped where anyone who invests in this technology can get a data advantage, and I think that will be fundamental. So <clears throat> yeah, it's a really critical point in there about the per-risk underwriting, because I guess generally, and Ryan, I want to get your thoughts on this, yeah. there is this tension between, as you underwrite, there's a lot of information out there, increasingly more and more information, and you, what you're doing, you can get a lot, very high resolution <coughs> on an individual building. How do you balance the ability to get um, information that people can actually make decisions on and know that you've got the right information when you, you're presumably capturing a lot of, a lot of data. How, how do you sort of boil that down to the key information that underwriters need? Yeah, I think one of the critical things, and this touches on a few different points here, is there's, a, there's since 2012, really, there's been a revolution in computer vision and AI, and that's, that's caught on in, in the tech industry, that's kind of caught on to varying degrees in other industries. In insurance, that's starting to catch on. I think there's a lot of awareness here, but the, the fundamental crux of the issue, I think, is how, how efficiently can you bring a very clear understanding and focus of the business need together with some of these emerging technologies, right? And that's, that's I think, what, what we try to focus on and, and a lot of our customers try to balance. So, so to your question, you know, how do we boil down all the types of information you could care about to, to the specific things you ought to care about? And that's with us having built, I think we've built the leading company that really understands property insurance risk and understands computer vision and AI. And, and bringing those things together means we're, we're picking out the, the precise pieces of information that are actually predictive of loss. Um, we, we understand that by working really closely with our customers and understanding loss history. Um, and, then, and then bringing those pieces of information together. So, that's, that's what allows you to kind of preemptively come up with an understanding about um, view of risk on every potential future risk. Um, okay. Um, so, Lawrence, I'll get back to a point. You, you, you brought up a couple of things. So, uh, and then, Richard, you also mentioned it about the, the, the sort of more sort of liquidity of capital on this point about as we think about AI and we think about you know, the very heavy costs the industry currently has to actually do business, what, what, where do you see the future? in terms of the role of the underwriter, and particularly given your, under, your rolling. I mean, at some level, if, we, if the algorithms get better and better, then you don't, arguably don't need underwriters at all. Is that, is that where you see the future? And if so, how do, you, how do you then create a dynamic in your business to actually get people to embrace what 
Ryan and Richard are doing as, as tools that could ultimately put them out of the job. <clears throat> I think int intellectually it's very easy to, to grasp what you just said and imagine a world where you don't need an underwriter, where you have um, algorithm making decisions. The reality of insurance, when you step back a little bit, is, is had a, a value and a simplicity shock. And already on the retail side, and consumers, all of us here on the table, uh, buy insurance and finance differently on the, at the retail level. Now, as you move up the risk chain towards more commercial lines and a bit more complex and hairy risks that are maybe less frequent but a bit more complex, that's where you start kind of asking, you know, how to make products simple. And I think insurance, we all love insurance for its complexity and we're missing the point. People don't buy insurance, it's sold to them and it needs to be simple. And I think it's the first shock. And the second is the value one. What do you bring in here? The value is linked to the, the cost of the chain. Personally, I think when you talk about technology, the first disrupted part is intermediation. The cost of intermediation, where information is freely accessible and instantly accessible, intermediation cost is coming down. So I think in you know, questioning the value chain, I would, not because I'm an underwriter, but I think intermediation comes first in, in the questioning and what's the value of intermediation. And I think, yes, the question of the underwriter role is coming up. Um, and it's coming up on the personal lines where the underwriting is actually now already largely automated pretty much everywhere, um, into small commercial lines, and I think that's why Satora is bringing in very interesting solutions. But as you move up into the heavy, dirty, and smelly stuff, that's where I think, at least today, and for the foreseeable future, we should make no mistake. Underwriters, people, are an asset, not a liability. I know that might not be the view of everybody here, but we strongly believe in that, and you're on the writer makes decisions that rely on data, and we need to equip them with better data. And for me, the data focus is, is a priority where everybody's late, understanding, structuring it. When it comes to making decisions, I was making, you know, my, I started in trading 20 years ago. Uh, you want to have a seasoned trader when things go wrong. And you can have algorithm, uh, algorithmic trading, and we've had that for 25 years, even not, if not more. Uh, you make a difference when you have actually someone able to think and to change the patterns and understand those inflection points. So I think it's a question of segmenting the value chain and, and looking at insurance not as one book, but in a different way. Okay. I mean, Richard, you're, 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 part of your offering is that you actually, for your clients, they can scale back the underwriters. Mm. Would you, are you in agreement with what Laurent says? Or do you think that actually you can push the boundaries a bit further and, and AI can actually move further into that area? you could have no underwriters. You could, run a, could you run an insurance business with no underwriters at all, and just capacity and, and distribution? It, it, I think it depends on, on the complexity of the underlying risk. So in very small commercial homogenous classes, then I don't think economically you can have a human in the loop um, just because the premium um, is so low. And the anecdote that we hear a lot from our customers is every time an underwriter picks up, picks up the phone to speak to a broker, we've already lost money on the risk. Um, so... I, th I think in small commercial and, and to a degree small mid-market, I think a lot of that will be automated and, and there won't be a human in the loop. The role of the underwriter will be in portfolio underwriting. So I think there'll be a, a shift from per-risk underwriting to portfolio underwriting. And there may be a bit of a merge of the skill set of the actuary and the underwriter. So maybe we'll have more analytical underwriters who, who will kind of think about the parameters by which they will, they will, <coughs> they will ultimately price risk before they see the risk. Um, and, and maybe we'll see more of these sidecar deals where you know, deals to be done between brokers and, and insurers around the, the broad parameters of, of the risks that they'll write. But I, I don't think we'll see in small commercial lines an underwriter saying, yes, you know, I want more information, I'm going to take seven days and I'm going to make a decision. That, 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 that will definitely fade away. Um, that's my view at least. I think with, with a large commercial, very complex risk, there'll always be a human there because it's, there's not enough data, um, it's too heterogeneous, and ultimately you need judgment because you don't have the data, so you know you don't know. So you have to really understand it. Okay. Um, so it's, that, that's going to be our view on it. Good. Well, lots of agreement going on so far. So we need to find some areas of uh, dissonance in here, I think. Um, Marcus, I want to transition the discussion a bit to some new lines of business. So it, it, it's, it's sort of particularly interesting when you find companies that are building new sources of revenue for insurance companies and new ways to protect risks for the consumers. So. Um, you've got a couple of interesting things going on related to AI, but actually even more intimately involved in AI around some new lines of business. Can you just, you just talk a bit about a bit about those? Yeah, so um, on, on, on your note, I fully agree that the world is getting more risky, not less risky. Political risks, cyber risks, technology risks, all of the new, new, the new solutions that come up 
present new risks. So we will need more people that can understand the risks, understand um, an alignment of interest with an end customer, understand how, how our technology is used, and then come up with an informed decision <coughs> using data and AI, but not replacing the underwriter, but rather enriching the job of the underwriter and, and giving them a new, a new freedom not to crunch numbers, but to really look at the risks. And, and in particular for the new risks, um, we, we now are the, the first company, we're the world market leader, because we have 100% market share, on ensuring AI. So the, that's a, that's, that is still very small, and, 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 and I think that will be the next wave after cyber, but it will take some time um, to develop that. Um, and when you look at, at where we start to use those AI components, you will see more and more cases where people just want to protect against a situation where a statistical distribution with um, a certain confidence level and a certain tail, what happens if the AI that is valid at 90% of the cases, what happens with the other 10%? And what happens if the other 10% cause significant trouble to anybody? Um, and, and, and we work on, and we have the first covers out there to ensure for that. Simplest example, um, you all know, all know the stories around the, the, the visual or the, the, the image recognition for X-ray scans. Um, and um, yes, the AI for many of those questions is more reliable than the ones of a medical doctor, but still um, the AI is not 100%. Perfect. And, and the question is, how can you deal with those things? Excellent. So you have got a 100% share of underwriting AI, I guess, AI risk, I suppose. Is the, the yeah, basis risk, yeah. yeah. Good. I hope uh, Boeing isn't one of your customers. Yeah, I'm not exactly. Um, Boeing, Boeing is one of our customers, but we have not insured the AI <laughs> component of that. It may, it may raise the interest in the topic. <laughs> they, they, yeah. um, Ryan, just on this, on this um, topic of new, new areas yeah. of risk and new opportunities in there, and also, uh, with what you're doing, it seems like there's some real opportunity to do some dynamic underwriting because you're getting yes. sort of, not real time, certainly very up to date information. So, interested, just what are you seeing in your business that is bringing some new, new protection to the end customer and some new opportunities sure. for insurers? You know, so I think, uh, I think the most exciting thing, there's a couple of things here. At, at a first level, we bring more risk relevant information up front. So right at the time of quote, our carriers can, can ping our API, get the, the correct information to help them better um, select and price and underwrite a policy up front so that they're much less likely on the back end to have to either do a post-binding adjustment or, or some other such thing. And that's, that's exciting. We're, we're having a lot of positive traction and interest with our customers there, but I would put all that in the bucket of helping us do a conventional workflow better, faster, and cheaper, right? So uh, if you price more efficiently up front, fewer post-binding adjustments, your expense ratio is, is positively impacted. Uh, your loss ratio, if you pick the right risk better, is positively impacted. But you haven't really revolutionized the whole business. Um, uh, where I think it's interesting is, do you go even to the next level? Now, if we've effectively enabled the ability to pre-underwrite every potential risk, the entire kind of universe of exposure, now can you really rethink your sourcing strategy? You know, increasingly the last, the last six months, we've had our customers starting to understand that, that they can look at this if they have all the, all, the inf all the right information about all the right risks up front. Can they now be proactive from a front of funnel standpoint? Can they look at targeted marketing? Can they, can they really go hand select the right risk they want to be on? And that is where I think you, you really start to, to, to revolutionize the business. So we are at an InsureTech conference, so I just want to change, move the conversation a little bit towards the view of what you can do internally versus where you benefit from partnership in this area. Um, Laurent, the school does quite a lot, though you tend to sort of keep it a lot of it under the radar in terms of, of partnering with people and also investing. Can you, you talk a little bit about strategically how you make choices where you, you bring external expertise in versus you... <coughs> would you you hire in-house to be able to do it in, in, the, in the sort of this AI context. Yeah, yeah. So I would say two things. First of all, um, as, as reinsurers, as, as DNA, we've been investing in, and you know that very well, better than I do, Matthew, cap modeling, the whole um, model uh, approach to our business uh, is, is inherent to what we've been doing. So I think it's, it's something that we have grown in-house a while ago. We've partnered with, with, with key firms and this ability to partner on the on the, especially NatCat modeling, has been something going on for, I would say, well, you tell me, 15 years? Yeah. RMS and so on. 
Um, so that has been going on. I think that sophistication and partnering uh, with modding firms uh, is going on. Maybe an interesting point moving to my second point on, on insure tech is um, clearly the modeling of CAT is, is extending to other areas. And, and we've been partnering now for seven years with uh, uh, Predicat, which is an offshoot between the RAND Institute and RMS, mm -hmm. extending modeling techniques from NetCAT to casualty. And here there is, there is a wide range of, of opportunities as well. So that's one aspect, and this has been going on way before AI has been a buzzword and, and intro tech and so on. The second thing, which is I think much more recent, is how do you, um, how do you go beyond that and go into innovation closer to insurance? And here, and sorry to, to sound like a broken record, we define ourselves as underwriters. So we do not invest for the sake of investing. If we invest in a company, it is to protect a, an operational partnership. And that is perhaps as well why we don't communicate so much and don't necessarily want to make so much noise about it, is we have some partnerships, operational partnerships. And what I mean by operational is generating underwriting premiums. The, the PNC insurance business is intermediated, so the service angle of our business is covered by brokers, and, and we don't want to compete with our broking partners. So what we, how we define ourselves is taking on risks. So when we approach InsurTech, we want to, to eat the risk. We want to have some of it. Um, and if that means to protect our investment that we need to invest, because these partnerships have to be long, the first years are loss making by definition, and, but we need then to want to, to, to hold the partner when it starts making, making a profit. So we've had, we've had at heart to, to combine this kind of underwriting partnership with investment coming, uh, coming second. And so we set up our PNC Ventures team three years ago. They've built a, a, a nice portfolio of partnerships and investments, and some of them are partnerships only. Um, and the key focus for me, uh, having a team of underwriters, and I could hear uh, Mr. Spino coming just before our round table here, is how do you permeate that innovation in, in the teams? And I very much agree with people define themselves in insurance way too much as who they are and who they're not. So people are actuaries. People are this and not something else. And I think it's, this is something that has to change. People have to be much more uh, interested and, and open to what's going on out there. So the question is, how do you have a PNC Ventures team, which is at the forefront, on the stage, literally, in this conference, for quite a few of them, uh, and, and a face internally as well in the business to the underwriters and driving the culture of the company. And that, to me, is, is, takes time. The pace of that transformation should not be rushed. It takes a lot of time to get people buying in and, and evolving slowly and not taking advantage of the first failure to say, well, you see, that's not working. Because to me, that's, that's too easy, and it's, it's just missing the whole, the whole long-term point. But so just to make sure I understood what you're saying, so you're, you're saying your, your kind of key <coughs> area of interest, your key driver is, is can you use it to inform the underwriting and, and make better decisions in the underwriting? That's right. Okay. Michael, let's turn to you. So, so running a data science team, um, I think it's quite a large team, how, how does the balance work at Prudential? Do you, do you favor sort of build versus buy, or, or how, do you sort of, how do you embrace what's happening elsewhere? And what do you think of it, I mean, in terms of the, the sort of companies out there who, who are offering AI? So, so I, I no longer run a data science team. I now run an AI team for the last five or six years before I joined uh, the pool. Uh, and there are some subtle differences, and we really want to talk about the differences, so I'm happy to, happy to do that. But to actually answer your question, so um, if, if we so kind of call for the hypothesis is that AI is pretty fundamental to the company. And uh, quite frankly, uh, you can disagree with that, and most of my colleagues will disagree with it, um, you know, un unless we base pretty much everything that we do, certainly when it touches the customers and our risk and everything, around um, AI, um, we have no chance of surviving the next 15 or 20 years. I think, I suspect we'd like to because we've been around for 170 and I, I guess most of them would want to stay, stay on for longer. Um, so, um, so, so therefore, uh, and where this sort of long preamble is leading to, therefore it doesn't make sense to um, effectively outsource the core of your differentiating value. Um, what we do like in terms of partnerships are people who get us closer to our customer. So um, one example is um, we've announced a partnership last summer uh, with a, 
London-based company called Babylon Health. And uh, they do a couple of things. They, uh, they are sort of a chat voice, uh, chatbot based triage and symptom checker. Um, yeah, it kind of works. Uh, oh, actually, Ali Pasa, I think the CEO is speaking at this conference. Uh, so um, yeah, they, they also do things like telemedicine and all these kind of things. So why do, do we do a partnership with them? Uh, and actually, we have taken them exclusively into uh, whatever it is, 12, 13, or 14 markets in Asia. And uh, we've, I think we've paid a, paid a fair deal of money for that. And why, why would we want to do that? Uh, it's because it gets us one step closer to the customer. And the moment, at the moment, we have infrequent interactions with our customer, customers. And most of those interactions are uh, unpleasant for us and for them. Uh, so that's not very nice. So how about changing that and making it a frequent interaction and understanding, therefore, the customer much better? And going back to what I mentioned earlier in terms of underwriting and pricing, once we have, well, let's just think about Babylon Health and health insurance as an example, once we have an understanding of how people feel and what kind of symptoms they enter and what, what their health status is, you know, Babylon also builds this digital twin thing where they try and understand not just how healthy you are right now, but what your prospects are going forward. Going forward. So once we understand all these things, then we can, we can interact with you in a very different way. And um, uh, if I may come back to something else that Lono said earlier on, and you, you, it's, I'm only following your advice by saying we need more controversy. Um, um, you're always speaking on me, huh? Yeah, you're sitting right <laughs> next to me. <laughs> and you're French, so I'm sorry, I have to pick on you. Uh, so, um, um, so uh, where was I? Uh, no, he said, uh, he said something like, um, uh, insurance is sold, not bought. And um, being still relatively new to insurance, obviously I think that's a strange thing to say, and I don't like it. And my colleagues tell me, well, I don't like it either, so, but suck it up, that's the way the industry works. But I think it's terrible. <laughs> Why would we, uh, if, if our proposition is that we have to force something more or less on them and sit them down and talk to them for hours and then finally make them sign on the dotted line and then run away very quickly and hope they never claim, uh, that's kind of a very strange business model, it seems. So how about I give... Oh, so, Mike, can I just, because the time, the clock is ticking, and we may have some questions. But well, we have controversy now. Can I, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 They're not just on the selling point. I also we just disagree guys, on pause, the... Pause that. So, yeah. I just, from the technology point of view, I'm not quite sure if we are going to be able to get questions from the audience. Does anybody... anybody oh, here we go. Okay. So, let me take a quick look at these. Um, so, we're going to just pivot to the audience questions now. Let me just read this one out. So, the first one says, is the pursuit of ever-increasing accuracy of risk selection and pricing via AI and predictive analytics, leading the industry into dangerous territory. And that gets three votes. So, Laura, I think you're right to return on the dangerous, on, on uh, Michael's comments there. So are, we, are you moving into dangerous territory? I think you can interpret what that means. I, I, I can't read the question. Can you please? So are we, basically what it's saying is, is the use of AI, is it moving us into dangerous territory? And it doesn't say what dangerous territory actually means. But I think, it, I think the, the context is yeah, a risk. And, and then I answer. I think it, it's creating a lot of opportunities, and, and whether we like it or not, that insurance is sold, not bought, is, is a fact today. Whether it is a satisfactory one, clearly not. The question is, how do we make it a product that is appealing? And then the question is, after we've had that disruption going on, and for a while, creates a bit of vertical questioning of the value chain, which, which we are going through. I think we're going to go through that for some time still, and AI will bring some opportunities. I think it's going to bring the question of how to integrate insurance products among a broader proposition that is bought, not sold. And that's perhaps where the, the lovers of insurance are going to realize that actually insurance value is better when it's packaged into something else that is not insurance, into service, for example. And, and that, for me, is a key trend of our business is, is over time, it's going to be a long time, is, is insurance could disappear as such into something that is either very simple or even not even visible to the customer. And, but they buy a service, they don't buy a product. Yeah, no, definitely one of the themes. Let's see, just one more question. Okay, so, so the, this question is going to four votes, and basically what it's saying is as you get more individual, the word is hyper-personalization, do you essentially become, there's a situation where certain risks become uninsurable. So if you're, example, in a floodplain, or if you're, if you're in a fire zone, um, do you, this, I think this maybe links back to the danger of AI. 
how does the industry deal with the fact that there are potentially risks you don't want to ensure? Or how does, how does the industry and society deal with that fact so that we don't exclude people red line? So I think this may be the last question. So this will give you each one of you a chance just to say, what is, how do we protect the future of insurance as a, uh, a way of paying out risk to everybody? So, so Ryan, do you want to go yeah. first on, on that one? Yeah, I think that's... I think those are separate issues. Hyper-personalization and, and risk pooling is, is basically what I consider a political issue. Um, you can precisely decide you know, a, a, a precise risk for a, given, for a given opportunity, and there's going to be a return on that. And then the question of how, how do you pool that with other buckets of risk, I think, is, is really a public issue. policy question. Okay. Richard, for you, how, how, do we, how do we remove that risk from society? Yeah, I, I, I'd agree. I think, I think um, you know, different insurers will also have different philosophies about the size of risk pools. Um, and you can think about some of the mergers we're seeing at the moment, you know, merging kind of long-tail business with, like, short-tail businesses. Um, how you think about the size of a risk pool, whether you're pricing on a per-risk basis, on a per-pool basis, that's both a government issue, it's also a company issue. Um, yeah, and I, uh, I think, kind of, historically, insurance companies have always thought about risk pools to, to kind of... Um, yeah, prevent this from happening. So um, I don't see any reason why a technology shift will necessarily change that. I think it will just provide more information about the nature of the risk pool. So, so Mark, just put a different twist on that, maybe put a positive side on it, which is, yeah, as Munich Re, you've got large capital to deploy, you can aggregate your risk. Do you see AI giving you more opportunity to write business in areas that are traditionally believed to be uninsurable or the, or the protection gap, is that sort of active part of it? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and we also have a different approach to the partner <coughs> with, the, with the startups because we feel like we would be too slow building for our cases to build up all the expertise in-house. We want to partner, we want to be able to connect based on technology with startups and with the external consultants. We just bought a share in, the, for example, the DFKMI, um, the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. And, and we invest heavily into that area because we want to use that expertise for covering new risks and for finding risks that maybe fell through the cracks where we now can provide insurance because we better understand the risk and can provide solutions that maybe have a different structure, different spin to it, but then we can make things actually really insurable um, that, that would not be insurable without the new technologies. Great. Well, unfortunately, we have, we have run out of time, but we've had a, I think a wide-ranging discussion um, a lot of consensus, which, which is good in some ways, but I think there's some interesting themes coming out, which is that there, we're seeing AI allowing more uh, help being provided to the original policyholders and actually reducing the risk by actually using the analytics to help them um, understand better what their own risks are and how to mitigate that. The concept of being able to therefore understand and choose um, the, the policyholders that you'd like to have, but at the same time not losing sight of the fact that the industry has a role to play and the government has a role to play. In, um, in dealing with all risk. It sounds like um, certainly for um, Prudential, SCORE and Munich, they are, as we know in many cases, they are very open to, to new ideas. So for those of you who haven't yet contacted those organisations and think you have a good idea, if it fits into um, underwriting and if it fits into new product ideas uh, or anything that, you know, and Michael sounds like he's got a very sort of fresh perspective on how to change the industry, then I'm sure they'll be delighted if you make contact with them. And, and if you li are like our three insurers and reinsurers in the panel and welcome AI and insurtechs, um, like, uh, and, and, you, and then you're sure that um, you, were, as an insurer, you will welcome Richard and uh, Ryan to come and talk to you about what they're doing with their, their businesses. So please join me in thanking our panel for a very, uh, very engaged discussion. Thank you.